sermon. Uh, today is Purim, and being a, a Hebrew student for the last several years, how many know what Purim is? Purim, ah, that's the one that knows what Purim is. Praise God. Purim is a Jewish celebration, a commemoration of how that God delivered the Hebrews from the wicked Haman in the kingdom of Persia. We know the story very well how that Hadassah or uh, Esther uh, went before the king and beseeched the king on the behalf of her own people uh, that they would be delivered from Haman. And the Bible tells us that Haman was hung from the very gallows which he had actually prepared for Mordecai. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because if you fast forward to our very day, there was someone else that was hanging, not from gallows, but from a cross. And it was through that hanging that you and I have been delivered from the evil one. So, how do you understand? I'm convinced that though most of us may think that we are Gentiles, I believe that we are grafted in. We are connected to the Holy Root. Amen. If you be Christ, then are you the seed of Abraham and heirs according to his promise. So the Jews are celebrating Purim today. That's a great victory. But for you and I today, for just a few seconds, could we clap our hands up to the Lord and shout unto God with a voice of triumph? Because this, this assembly has been uh, like a second home to me. Bishop E. Bryant gave an 18 year old evangelist that didn't know nothing about nothing an opportunity to come. And I, I thought it was interesting uh, that it was always during spring break. And the colleges down in, in around Evansville are on spring break this week. I don't know about up here, but it was always spring break. And my my wild friend, Josh Wilson, would always come along with me and we would stay in the hotel together. That was back in our bachelor days. And I'm so grateful uh, for uh, being able to be here again uh, during the spring break. And it brings back a lot of memories and services that we've had together uh, in times past. And I'm looking forward to a great weekend this weekend as well. First Corinthians chapter number two. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and beginning in verse number 1. This is a familiar portion of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2 and 1, and there say, Amen. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ, and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness. Notice the great apostles' words here. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I just want to talk to you about the power of God. Hey, we'll go to Hebrew and we'll, we'll, we'll get in waters to swim in tomorrow night as far as that, but, but, but tonight can we just have an experience? I'm not so prideful. 
people have taught me to think uh, that everywhere I go, everyone remembers every story and every illustration that I give. Moreover, I'm certain that there are those here tonight that were not here during that time. But I recall many years ago, uh, as a teenager, 16 years old, feeling a calling to preach the gospel. And I remember, uh, whenever I felt this calling, my pastor was very open-minded to me. And he told me, he said, Jeremy, I believe that God has called you to preach. Now, the toilets be clean. Yeah. And I said, well, wait a minute. I, that's, God didn't say that. He said to preach. He, he, didn't, he didn't say to swap the, the toilets. And, and so I, I swapped the toilets. Praise God. I'm telling you what. The Apostle Paul would have been proud to come in and to use our toilets. They were clean. I mean, they were clean. The pastor said, you feel a calling to preach? I said, yeah. When am I going to be up? He said, well, my car is dirty. And so I would wash and wax pastor's car. He never did it himself after that. And I mowed the grass as well. And I thought, wait a minute. God uh, did not call me to be the groundskeeper and the janitor at the church. God called me to preach. But what I didn't know is that the very first lesson that my pastor was teaching me was one of humility and obedience. Yeah. And there's no preacher that's worked his way who cannot learn humility and obedience. Amen. That's the truth. That's bonus. That's extra. I won't charge you for that. Okay. But it's important. And I understood that as a teenager. The Lord really, uh, I knew, was speaking to me. And I, and I was waiting for that opportunity to be able to preach. And I'll never forget the first time that I found the pulpit and I preached. And after my wife and I got married, I'm going to be very, very frank with you tonight. After my wife and I got married, uh, we were digging through some old boxes before we were moving over to India. And we found the cassette tape from my first sermon. And the vehicle which we were driving had a cassette tape uh, player in it. And we put that rascal in and we were going to the store. And my wife, I just, I could not remember all the things that I had said. And, I, and it was a good thing that I had forgotten because I want you to know, it was terrible. There was nothing that I said that made sense. Nothing came together. I kept my eyes forward with my hands at 10 and 2. And I could feel the eyes of my wife just, just burrowing into the side of my face. Finally, when I looked over at her, her face was red. She was holding back her chuckles and she said, Honey, what in the world are you talking about? I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just getting up there. I'm excited about God. The church was getting with me because they were excited that I was excited about God. And, and God moved anyway. Yeah. And so after all of this, we, uh, the young ministers at my home church, we, we always wanted to go preach at other churches. And this was something uh, that, that we uh, kind of took as a challenge because we knew that it must be the pinnacle, the very pinnacle of ministry is going to some other church and preaching. We use the terminology preaching out. Does that make sense? Preaching out. And we saw other evangelists before uh, the, the, the advent of the Palm Pilot and, uh, and other handhelds and tablets that you see today. Uh, in that day, evangelists had little uh, pocket calendars inside their coat pocket with a pen. So we saw evangelists have those. What did me and my friends do, the young ministers? We all went to the store and we bought calendars like that and pens and put them in our pockets. And we wanted to be evangelists and we're teenagers. We don't know what's going on. Finally, one day, the phone rang. I was living still with my mother and father. I was 17 years old at the time. And the pastor said, I'm going to be out of town. I want you to come and to preach for me. And I found uh, that I, I could hardly contain myself as I was hearing these words because I, I couldn't find my book. And then I finally found my book. And I said, wait a minute. Let me see if I'm available on that day. I knew that my calendar was empty, but I was going to look anyway. I said, Pastor, hold on just a minute. Let me see if I can squeeze you in, you know. And so I was just so excited to get to go and preach out. And, and so I put that down in my calendar. I told them, I said, you're in luck, brother. I'm open on that day. And I was so pumped up about this. 
And so I went, I went into my mother and my father was sitting in the living room and I told my mom and dad, I'm an evangelist now. I went in there, man, my head was this big. I was so excited about the opportunity to get to preach out because that was to us the pinnacle. You know, we saw other evangelists come in. So we thought it must be a perpetual revival all the time. It must be the high all the time. That Holy Ghost power, I mean, these, these, these guys can't take baths because if they do, they'll be walking on water, you know. I mean, I mean they've got to take a shower. They don't have any other choice. And, and so in my mind, that's what I thought about evangelism. And, and so I, I, I told my friends, I said, I'm going to preach out. You guys are going to miss me on that day. I'm going to preach the gospel. And my mother, she told me, she said, honey, I'm going to go with you. I got really upset. Because other evangelists didn't take their mommies with them. <laughs> so I, I, I was very, very hesitant about this. They took their wives. And I did not want there to be a mistake about that whenever I go and, and visit this other church. And so, so uh, but I, in my mind, I, 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 I had this illusion of grandeur. She's not going to hinder the thousands that are going to be there. I mean, it's going to be powerful. Ethiopia hasn't, hasn't seen nothing. They don't have any idea what's going to happen in this little one-horse town in southern Indiana. And so we finally went on to the church service and we got there about 10, 15 minutes early and there was no one there. The church was an old run-down shack, hand-painted sign out in the front. It was interesting to me because in my mind, I still had this illusion of grandeur. I thought, the Greyhound buses are on their way. <laughs> People, they're going to flood in here just any moment. Certainly, it wasn't a traffic jam. We were out in the middle of nowhere. So in my mind, I'm wrestling with this. Well, what is this all about? So finally, a little old lady came with the keys, and she was rattling the keys. She could barely walk into the church. And... Uh, she got into the church and uh, I told my mother, I said, well, I'm glad you're here because you're 50% of the congregation that I'm going to preach to today. And so we went into the church and uh, one front portion of the floor had actually caved in. I thought, if somebody does get happy, we're going to have a funeral right after this service because the floor was caved in. There were flies all over the place and that probably was getting me ready for India. And uh, so God knows, uh, he works in mysterious ways, but uh, his, his wisdom and his ways are higher than ours. I, in retrospect, I look back at that and I thought, God was just training me to be able to preach and keep flies out of my mouth while I'm preaching. And that's an art. I learned how to do it. I'm the best. And so after we began the service, there was another little lady that came in and sat down. And then a young lady came in and she had at least a dozen kids. And I don't think that they really knew how to sit in church service very well. Because they sat toward the back and for some reason, I don't know why, this mother or babysitter or aunt or whoever it was, let them bring their toy pistols, their cowboy hats, their bows and arrows. They were playing cowboys and Indians in the back of the church while I'm preaching. Suddenly it got real quiet and they had crawled under the pews and popped up in the middle and started shooting at me while I'm preaching. <laughs> now I want you to know, folks, this was not the vision that I had in my mind when God called me to preach. Yeah. I saw the, the lame man leaping. Yeah. I saw the blind man see. Oh. I didn't completely understand what God was trying to do to me now, but it didn't feel right. And I want you to know I was ready to get out of that service because up to that point, I didn't even know that God really even knew that we were there. It's, that's how dead it was. And so I was preaching, I was saying things, a lot of it probably didn't make any sense, but I, I told them about Jesus, I told them about how that he died on the cross because he loved them, and, and I went on and, and, and gave my spiel. Suddenly at the end of the service, I felt the Lord speak to me. He said, I want you to have a prayer line. The first thing that went through my mind was, was an idea of doubt. It's not going to take long to get me a prayer line. Yeah. I'll do it because I know that the Baptists aren't going to be here to crack a barrel today. Yeah. It's not going to take a long time. So I asked, anyone want prayer? We're going to have, a, have an old-fashioned prayer line. 
And it was interesting because uh, my mother came up to the front. She was the only one. Now I'm really glad that you came. Yeah. The little old lady that opened the door raised her hand and she said she wanted prayer as well. She had a bandage on her hand. I didn't know the situation at that point in time. But my mother had a blood clot on her leg. And that blood clot stuck out of her leg about a half an inch. It was black. It was, it was terrible to look at. She was going to have surgery the very next week. And so I prayed for my mother. And I want you to know that we really felt God move. I'm going somewhere with this because this is important. It's important that we understand this. I went back to pray for the little old lady that had the keys. God for her. I prayed for her and again. To the spirit of the Lord. Sure. Got in the car and went home and I was frustrated. God, what was that all about? There hardly anybody came. I was expecting a multitude and no one showed up. The Lord was silent to me. We got home and my mother removed the bandage that was around her leg and the blood clot was completely healed. Yeah. Yeah. probably stopped by a time or two. Preachers like the Tasmanian devil. We love Brother Shepherd. Fantastic man of God. We were in revival with him. And the pastor that had me come over and fill in for him came and visited that revival the next week. And he was the strong, silent type, and, I, and I'm not. Uh, you know, he's very reserved, and I'm very sanguine and uh, a little crazy at times. And so it was interesting. He came up to me and he said, Brother Jeremy, I want to talk to you. So I thought, oh boy, I've troubled the waters and half of this church has left. <laughs> One person, two people left. I, I, I don't know. So I was scared to death. It hindered my worship the entire service. After the service was over, he came up to me and he said, you prayed for my mother. She had the bandage on her hand. She burned her hand the day before. was in the hospital the day before. She went home to put some salve after the service to put salve on her hand again. Whenever she took the bandage off, the burn was completely healed. This is what God taught me. We oftentimes think that signs, wonders, and demonstration depends on how well we can articulate what we believe. Now, I believe in articulating our faith well. I believe in understanding our faith well. But let me tell you today, church family, if you and if myself will sow the seed faithfully, God said, I will give the increase. God said, if you go and preach, I will confirm your word through signs and wonders and miracles following. So it does not matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you've got a pedigree in this thing. All that matters is that you are a believer because these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. I want you to know, church family, if you are a believer, you have got the goods to do a mighty work for God. about the early days whenever we were in India because recently, especially, I had a man just a couple of weeks ago, a man from the United States who called me because he was uh, doing some ministry among some Asian people and some Buddhists and he knew that we had worked in Burma and that we had worked with a lot of Buddhists. And he just asked me, frankly, how do I reach a Buddhist? After having lived overseas for several years, one thing that I have learned is that the gospel is applicable to every culture. Sure. Sure. Amen. You don't have to sweeten it. You don't have to change it. You don't have to trim off the edges. It's applicable to every culture. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's applicable to every country. And so my words probably surprised this brother whenever I said, brother, Reach them with the gospel. Don't try to teach hermeneutics. Don't go uh, to the tabernacle plant. They don't understand what the tabernacle is. Just tell them about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All right. All right. So that sounds simple enough. I've got a message 
later, he said, Brother, she was crying. The presence of God was moving upon her. I said, Exactly. Because every time that you mobilize with Christ crucified, He's going to be faithful to His Word, and He's going to show up with demonstration of power. Church family, sometimes we make it way too hard. We think we have to know the right person, that we have to bring in the right preacher. Let me tell you something, what I've learned about the New Testament. Do you want to know who the preacher is? Take your finger like this, point up to one God, and now point to yourself. Because a preacher is a proclaimer of the gospel. Yeah. And whenever you read in the New Testament, you can see everyone proclaim the gospel. I'm not talking about just from the pulpit. I'm talking about in the streets, from house to house to yeah. house. Amen. They proclaimed the truth. And what did God do? He showed up and he showed out. And because of this, people understood the truth. Amen. I was encouraged by reading the scripture that says in 1 Chronicles 16, 24, declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Church family, after living in India for several years, 330 million gods that they venerate in that country. So I have a task at hand. Because of everything else that the people worship, I have to give them a reason to add Jesus to the mix. Sure. And more than that, to put away their idols. This is not an easy task to do. Because you have to sift through so much of the culture generations of false doctrine and in the beginning oftentimes I would pull my hair out so I decided no more I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified so whenever we went to the streets we would preach Jesus Christ and him crucified the death burial and resurrection of our Lord 15 minutes in the street that's it 15 minutes Sometimes five people would be standing there. Sometimes 500 would gather around. But after we would preach the first day, Christ crucified, guess what? We would say, is there any sick among you? We do not just have a doctrine. We have a doctrine with a demonstration. 330 million don't come. They have all the doctrine they can handle and then some. But whenever it comes to my Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. I have much more than just a doctrine, yeah. but I have a demonstration and I have a power. And it is a power that is made available to you and to me. Now unto him that is able to do it, see, abundantly, above all that we can ask and think, according to the power that worketh in us. Church family, I come by here to tell you, you've got a power that is working with
is the spirit that giveth life. Right now. We are worshipers in both spirit and the truth. If all that we preach is just the truth, the doctrine without spirit will dry up. On the other hand, if all we preach is spirit without the truth will blow up. Interesting to think about, isn't it? We've got to find a balance between the truth and the spirit. And I find it interesting that in all of the works that the Lord did in the scripture, he never left the prophet of God out on a limb by himself. Sometimes they may have felt forsaken. Sometimes as the old prophet who was thrown down into a pit said, I'll never speak in this name again, look where it's got me. Still, whenever he got out of the pit, he said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I've got to go and preach. I've got to go and preach one more time. At the end of the day, it was his experience that compelled him to further ministry. Every, listen, I'm talking about India right now, but I'm about to talk about the United States in a moment. Listen, because I want us to make the comparison. I want to make sure that you get what I'm talking about tonight. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 5, verses 1 through 7. 1 Samuel 5, 1 through 7 says, The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashkelon. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by them. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. He must have tripped. And when they arose early on the morrow, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, both the palms of his hands, were cut off. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon, nor any that come into Dagon's house, tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashton unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds. You know what that is? Emeralds. Think about that for a minute. It's a curse. Even Ashdod and the coast thereof, and when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. I love what the Bible says, that only the stump yeah, was left. Dagon was reduced to become stumpy because of the power of the Shekinah glory of God. I want to tell you, church family, Every God that is worshipped in this world today is someday going to fall prostrate before our God. And sometimes they are going to be broken. Because we know that our God is great. And He is greatly to be praised. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty. Christians. 
And I said, okay, brother, absolutely. He said, I want you to go with me. I said, I'm, I'm booked on that day. I can't go. I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I can't go, but I'm going to help you go. So I handed him some money for his train ticket, his hotel fees while he was there. And I said, give him some extra as well to conduct a meeting. He went there and he set up a tent to start preaching. And the people started gathering in. And a woman approached him. And she said, I saw you in my dream just a few days ago. She was a Hindu woman. She said, I saw you in my dream. But she said, it's funny. There was a white man that was standing next to you in my dream. And he said, I knew then that the Lord had ordained this. And it was interesting because she began to relate her testimony. To him. She said, I'm a Hindu. My family are worshippers of Shiva. Shiva is one of the gods of the Hindu trinity. And she said, my family for generations have been worshippers of Shiva. She said, but I had a sickness in my body. And she said, this sickness is, it, it has hindered me. I, the doctors told me I'm going to die. And uh, she said, I, I've been, had a body full of pain. And she said, I can't eat. And, and all of these things are happening to me. And she said, and so I decided I was going to pray and fast to my God. She, she had a shrine set up in her hall, a small altar. And she said, interestingly, that she felt to go on a 21-day fast. The 21-day fasts are not part of Hinduism. Enough, but she said in her heart she felt that she would do a 21 day fast. And she did. And on the 21st day, as she did, uh, or the 21st night, as she did every night, she would have a prayer vigil in the night time in front of the idol of Shiva. During that prayer vigil, Shiva appeared to her and said, I can give you anything. The only God that can heal you is Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Church family, baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And completely healed of our faith. You know, the word of God is true. Whenever it says, if you believe in one God, thou doest well, even the devils in hell believe in one God and they tremble. Church family, if we could just understand what God wants to do through us. If we're willing to go, if we are a willing vessel, God is going to show up and he's going to move on our behalf. One thing that happens oftentimes, people who the Lord begins to use in a particular way is that they become heavy and high-minded. I want to warn you against this. I recall many years ago, Bishop E. Bright prayed over me before I went to India. And he said, I foresee thousands of people, thousands, thousands in India, thousands in that region. I recall him prophesying that over me. His prophecy was fulfilled, but it came with a warning. Don't get a big head, young man. You stay humble before the Lord. And I want to tell you today, everything that has happened in India has been because of God's grace and mercy. I'm just thankful that I was in the right place at the right time. It's interesting that the Bible talks about the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, they, they understood something about God, but they decided they're going to build a tower. They said, we're not going to do it in the name of our God. We're going to make a name for ourselves. Sure. What happened? God used the tongue. He confounded the tongue right. at the Tower of Babel. And he did it because they said they're going to make a name for themselves when they build that tower. I'm thankful today that I can testify that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it and are saved. Whatever God does through me or through you, whatever he does through you, understand that it is all because of his grace and his mercy. It's not yours. You don't own it. It's God's grace and mercy upon you. 
stay humble before God. Stay humble before God. The Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice of the idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, that there is none other God but one. Although, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods, many, and lords, many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Today we live in a country that is ever changing. In India, the demons that manifest themselves are very demonstrative. They're making the comparison between my natural home and my adopted one. I could say this, that while the demons in India, and in the East especially, are very demonstrative, the ones here in the United States are just as many, but more subtle. So don't think for a moment that we deal with more devils because of the 330 million gods that are worshipped in India than what we do right here in the United States. The demons here are more cunning. They're more crafty. They tend to fly under the radar, if you will. That's the reason why we must pray like never before, so that our discernment is keen. Because you don't have to look far to find a demon in India. Sometimes here in the United States, we get so cold to living in amongst the things that we live in that we don't see through spiritual eyes. And detect the darkness for what it truly is. Right? I'm making sense. This is where I was heading tonight. This is my running thing. I'm sorry. The wings just caught the air, but I won't be wrong. In our scripture text tonight, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, we find the Apostle Paul in a position that I think sometimes we find ourselves here in our God-blessed America. Think about Paul for a moment, if you will. Can I just talk to you for a minute? The great apostle, the one who was chosen, a chosen vessel to bear the name of Jesus before the Gentiles, right? The one who was stoned and left for dead, prayed for, risen back to life and went running to the next city to preach the gospel. We find him in our scripture text tonight with a very different testimony. Oftentimes he testified about how that the Lord had struck him down on the road to Damascus. He was very repetitive about that testimony in the epistles. Now he has a very unique testimony telling the church in Corinth, when I was with you, I was in weakness. I was in fear. And I was in much tremble. He never goes on to say why in either epistle to the first, but in first Corinthians or second Corinthians, he never gives us any indication as to why was in fear and trembling. And I want you to know the scripture does give us the reason. The Apostle Paul, when he went to Corinth, the Bible tells us the story in Acts 18. The Bible tells us that he went and he was with Aquila and Priscilla. And what did he do there? He made tents. I want to ask you a question. Why would the great apostle Make tents. Why would he go to a place like Corinth where there were many people that were lost and make tents and moreover be scared, be in fear and trembling? Why? Go back to chapter 17 and find out why. The Bible 
It's very clear in Acts chapter number 17. We all know the story very well. The Bible tells us about Paul's encounter with the men of Athens at Mars Hill. Listen very carefully to this point. The Bible says, Then Paul stood, in verse 22 of Acts 17, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Discernment was in operation. He was able to pick out that this altar to the unknown God is I think you should Google when you get involved. Because there were many altars to the unknown God set up in different places. The Greeks, though pagan, were hungry spiritually. And that hunger brought an understanding of a God that they didn't quite understand. They knew that he existed. They understood that he was there. They understood that he was a spirit. And another testimony that you can find, check it out online if you like. I've read some blogs about it, some very interesting historical proofs of this altar to the unknown God. It existed. And the Greeks were very adamant about praying at this altar to the unknown God. In fact, when they prayed at other altars and those other gods didn't answer their prayer, they always went to the altar of the unknown God. That was the discernment that Paul was operating in. But then what does he do? What does he preach to them? He does not preach the gospel. You read on and on and on. He talks about creation. He talks about how the man came about. But he does not preach the death, burial, and resurrection. It's written. He preached creation. An important topic. But not one that's likely to bring a great revival. And it didn't. In fact, the Bible tells us that there were just certain men that claimed to be. Sure, every soul counts, but this was not the revival that he had anticipated. So, from Acts 17 to Acts 18 and verse 1, Paul, the Bible tells us, after these things, Paul departed from Athens. This tells us the story about when he was there. But Paul gives us his journal, his diary, what he felt in 1 Corinthians 2. He said, when I came to you, I knew there's something wrong. I was missing it somehow. I was preaching to a bunch of Greeks, trying to reach them at their level of intellect. Because of all of the Greek gods, Paul was educated. He understood all the Greek gods that they worshipped. They never could agree on who the creator was. So that's why Paul preached a sermon about creation in Acts 17 to the Greeks. But it did not bear the fruit that he desired. So because of this, he began a season of self-searching. The great apostle picked up his trade of tent making. While he was there with Priscilla and Aquila in weakness, in trembling, feeling inferior in the face of the challenge which was before him. Athens was a place that was pagan. Listen. So was Corinth. And Corinth, maybe even much more. He said, when I came to you, I was in weakness and I was in fear. But during that time of self-searching, he leveled with God. And he said, I made up my mind. I knew that, you, that these Greeks were not Jews. 
I knew that they were not, that they did not understand who Joel was. He couldn't, he didn't think that he could preach in the same manner that the Apostle Peter did on the day of Pentecost. He didn't think that it would make any sense to them, but I want you to know that the gospel is relevant yes, to every culture. Yes, sir. Here is sir. So when he went to Corinth, he said, I've got to have a change of my modus operandi. He said, I've got to change it. So I've made up my mind. Yeah. I'm not going to know anything yeah. among you. But Christ All right. and Him crucified. Amen. And that my words would no longer be with enticing words of man's wisdom. My oh. preaching was now going to be with demonstration right. and with power. Right. Church family, I want you to know the only faith that is going to stand today is not going to be faith standing in the wisdom of men. It's going to be faith that is going to stand through the power of Almighty God. And the only way that's going to work is whenever we preach the gospel that we allow God to move, that we allow God to show up and confirm His word with signs, wonders, and miracles. So you and I have a choice to make. Listen, we have a very important choice to make. Paul tried to change his approach. Think about it. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost to Jews. They knew who Joel was. They knew what the Holy Spirit was. They understood this vernacular. Paul had doubts that the Greeks would comprehend it. Because he thought, I'm going to do this myself. And he omitted God from the equation of getting understanding and quickening their spirits. Listen. We, in the last many several years, anyway, America's changed since I was overseas a lot. It's changed in the last several years, certainly in the last 50 years. Definitely, it's changed a lot. Yes, sir. Listen, we are not dealing with an Acts 2 generation. You hear me? My generation did not grow up in a school where the principal led the school of prayer and where teachers would read from the scripture. My generation didn't experience that. My parents' generation did. But mine did not. You understand what I'm saying? So we're dealing with a culture today that is not an Acts 2 culture, but an Acts 17 culture. Does that make sense what I'm saying? And because of this cultural shift, some churches have tried to change their mode of operation to become relevant to become relevant to the culture. But I've come to serve you notice today that the gospel is relevant to every culture. In the same way it was 50 years ago in what was more of an Acts 2 culture in America, in the same way that it is today in our Acts 17 culture. Do not make the same mistake that Paul made and try to use enticing words of man's wisdom. Yeah. Our preaching and our proclaiming the gospel and every time that we get up out of bed, we have to make sure that our ministries, our personal evangelism is quickened by the Spirit yes. of God yes. and it is emboldened by the power of the Holy Ghost and in turn that God will show up and confirm that proclamation of truth with a dem demonstrative anointing. Yes. Church, hear me today. All of the programs and things that we do sometimes that are fun and good and all in, in certainly in, in good fun. At the end of the day, most of them are going to amount to the ten part of the For God hath chosen. Word, the proclaimed word. And 
they will always please God. That through the preached word that the lost will be saved. We dare not touch this sacred call and commission that God has given us to preach and to teach the gospel. And I promise you that we will be faithful to it. We don't have to worry about converting somebody from evolutionism to creationism, the Greek culture to our Jewish culture. When God shows up and heals their body, that oh, yes. confirmation is already there. Amen. They don't need any proof. Amen. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Amen. We think that we've got to have all kinds of pomp and glitter to get a crowd around. Listen, all we need is the Shekinah glory of God to show up and we take our time to preach the gospel and share the word of God with some of us in church family. God is going to do great things if we will just get back to the basics and quit making it tougher than what it is. Listen, you are a child of the King and God has already, how many of you all are filled with the Holy Ghost tonight? God has already filled you with the Holy Ghost so you got the goods. Maybe you don't feel like it right now. I know maybe sometime, hopefully after the end of revival, you feel like you're going to hell with a water pistol or something. I hope that's the case. But not every time that you get up out of bed, you feel like that you can go and conquer all. But let me make sure that you're cognizant of the fact that the Holy Ghost is within you. And you have within you, whether you're a new convert or a seasoned saint of God, you have within you the power to set a legion of demons to flight. Amen. Amen. I don't need everybody. I just need two or three people to agree with me and we can see God do something great here today. So this is revival. And I know that there are other churches that are here tonight. I want you to take this back to your church as well. But we need to have a fresh baptism and a fresh anointing tonight. Amen. We are living in a great culture, and we're frustrated. We feel weak and helpless. I watched Facebook after the last election took place. Preachers, men of God, throw their hands up in the air and said, well, there goes the neighborhood. does not matter who's sitting in the Oval Office. It's true. Our kingdom is not of this world. And we're frustrated about the definition of marriage. And we're frustrated about the definition of life. And we're frustrated with all of these things going on in our government, church, the symptoms. Yeah. That's not the problem. We're getting frustrated at the symptoms. Whenever we need to go to the root of the problem. And whenever I see my country going in the wrong way, instead of being angry, I should be challenged. And I should be convicted. Because if the moral climate of our Greek culture is going down, oh, it's my responsibility. Yeah. Oh, I felt a cold wind blow in on that one. Church, it's my responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And it's your responsibility. Yeah. It is our responsibility. Amen. If the moral climate is going down, if we're waiting for the right person to get in the White House, the probably doesn't have the Holy Ghost anyway. If we're depending on that and not depending upon God, we've got our priorities in the wrong place. The world is waiting on the church of the living God. Washington, D.C. has got a city set up on a hill. You understand my role in the grand scheme of this. As you stand to your feet in this place today, tomorrow we'll get in waters to swim in. Tonight we'll just burger and fries. But 
We're going to take a time of prayer. Sincere prayer. Because I have watched too many people in the church feel inferior. When you hold it in your hand, the only gospel. That's the only truth that has the power of being in the free. The holders. You hold it in your hand. Don't feel inferior to us. The Greek culture is a strong one. But just as Dagon fell prostrate before the ark of God, likewise, for the idols that have been erected in our country fall flat to be fall prostrate before our God. Yes, yes. When you preach the gospel, when you preach the lost, when you talk to that co-worker, that neighbor, that family member, it's not just your words. It's a God that's waiting to confirm those words. Amen. Power. Amen. Demonstration. So it's not going to take some high wire evangelist. This power I'm talking about is required for the marquee lights. All you have to do is be willing to say, God, I want to be used. I'm not worried about looking good. I'm not worried about using enticing words. I'm not worried about articulating what I what I believe in a fancy manner. All I want to do is know you. Have the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your son. We're going to turn this sanctuary into a prayer room. Thank you for allowing me to take my time. I preached longer than I wanted to, but I feel a whole ghost food here tonight. And I want us to take advantage of this. Church family, I want to invite you to come. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. And we're going to believe God together tonight. This is what, this is the direction I want us to pray. Because whenever I ask how many of you all have the Holy Ghost, you will ever hand went up that I can see. You've already got the power within you to do great things for God. So what we're going to do is take some whatever's on their heart tonight. We're going to stir that gift up. Because until that gift is stirred up within our hearts, we're going to remain frustrated in our soul and we're going to remain frustrated in our claiming of this truth and we're going to continue to feel inferior as we try to reach the great culture which we're living in. So as they begin to sing tonight, church family, would you lift your hands up to the Lord and let's get honest with him tonight. Would you lift your hands up to our hands all over this place and let's be honest with God tonight. Let's be honest with him tonight. Go ahead. Go ahead. In Jesus' name. Souls are depending upon what you do. Tonight. 